live in a culture, church, of upgrading. And when we upgrade to different things, we often find ourselves trusting in online reviews, right? Recently, Christina and I, my wife, we've been looking at getting a new ceiling fan. We've been looking at getting new bed sheets, just kind of upgrading our room a little bit. And my goodness, the technology of bed sheets. It, it, I mean, th there's, there's a brand, I'm not promoting them by any means, so I'm not going to say the name, is they're, they're, they're weaving in silver that has like this special antimicrobial so you don't have to wash your sheets. God, like, come up with a better, like, tagline or something, because that just sounds gross. Like, just, just wash your sheets. It's, it's not hard. It just, just do it. And what's crazy is when we go to these online reviews and when we look at these things, we get this, we, we see these star ratings, right? We got one star all the way to five stars. And then you read the reviews and on the reviews, you see one side that gives a product five stars and they love this product so much and they would highly recommend it to anybody and everybody. But yet then right below it, literally the next review below it will give it a one star review and will call you dumb for even clicking on the ceiling fan that you're trying to buy. And they'll say this is the worst product ever. So how do we how do we trust any of these things? And what we find ourselves looking for is we find ourselves looking for the best, right? We're trying to find the best. We want to invest our money in a ceiling fan that's not going to break in the next year or in the next two years. So what we're looking for is something better. And sometimes these simple words like better can be a little tricky to nail down. Sometimes these things that we say is the best or is better is pretty universal. But other things are pretty subjective. Initially, when we think of the word better, oftentimes we're saying that this is better than that. And most of the time, as I mentioned, better is a matter of opinion. So what makes something truly better? What makes something so much better that we can say it's eternally better? In a world of upgrades and bigger and better, what is amazing now won't be in the matter of a few years. So we can't rely on what is in front of us because it won't take long for that to go the way of the dinosaurs. And yet we are lulled every year or so into believing that the next big thing will truly make us happy. Finally, something that will be better, faster, stronger, and greater. And as most of you know, church, this world is only great at showing us perfect inconsistency. The world we live in is constantly changing. And so there's not much that we can look to for any sense of consistency, comfort, or hope. So then we are faced yet again with a hard question. Where, what, or who do we look to for some sense of consistency, comfort, and hope? All of us are affected by the brokenness of this world, amen? We've all seen this, we've all seen this world break down at some level or another. But I believe that that longing for something better, church, is deeper than what the world has to offer to fill it. We have heard testimony after testimony saying much of the same thing. Something was missing in my heart. I tried to fill it with the things of this world until I found who? Jesus. This, we're, we're not that Baptist, guys. We, you guys can respond. I like to call us Calvary-costal. We're Calvary, but, we, but we, we let the Spirit go. So you guys can repeat, you guys can answer the questions that I ask. Until we found who? Jesus. So what I'm proposing this morning, church, is very simple. And that is, Jesus is better. Jesus is best. 
I would even clarify, church, that Jesus is eternally better. And we're going to see how that works out in our text this morning. As we see in our text, in the rest of the book, the author of Hebrews, who we don't know who he is, and that's okay. We actually aren't even 100% sure who the author is writing to. We just know that he's writing to the Hebrew people. We don't know if there's a specific area of, of the region that, that he's writing to, but we know that an author divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit wrote these words as a letter to encourage a church in that this simple truth is profoundly great for their lives, and that is that Jesus is better. And as you read through, you see, that you see him say that Jesus is better than angels. Jesus is better than Torah, than Moses, than Aaron. And that, and that the new covenant that Jesus is offering to us today is better than the old covenant. And that the access that we now have as believers and Christians in this church, the access that we now have to God is greater than it ever has been. The message in the book of Hebrews is as radical as it gets, believe it or not. Have you ever stopped to think about how you view God? What are the different core beliefs, the different things that you bring into answering that question? How do I view God? The original hearers of this message lived in a context that, many, uh, 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 that had many beliefs and thoughts that were not far from the thoughts and beliefs of today. For example, the Jews viewed God as being holy and therefore very different than humanity. To say that God became human would be considered blasphemy. Which is why the Pharisees and the Sadducees had such a hard time with Jesus when he became human and believing what he was saying. They're saying there's no possible way that that could happen because he's holy and he's distinct and he's different than all of us. And for the Greek Stoics that were hearing the, the message of Hebrews, they believed that the gods lacked any real feeling at all. The word that they would use was apatheia, where we get our term apathetic. To say that the gods could feel would suggest that they could be swayed this way or that way and be influenced, much like our five-star review system. The Epicureans who heard the message of Hebrews believed the gods lived in the in-between, a place that was completely detached from the realities of the universe and was completely unaware of the existence and the sufferings of humans. If a God was involved in the happenings of humanity, it would make them less than gods. And this was the frame of thinking that the message of Christianity entered into the ancient world. God was not only aware this is the Christian message part, part of it, that God was not only aware of humanity and their flaws, but had pity and felt sorrow and joy. That he cared deeply for humanity, so much so that he involved himself to the point of becoming a human to die on a cross for our sins and our failures. And for centuries they had a picture of an untouchable God. And now, are they, now they were confronted with a God who has gone through everything that they would go through. Not only that, but he would go through it to the fullest amount. And so our text this morning bestows upon Jesus the title that is not given to anybody else, but is the title of the Great High Priest. And this morning, I want to break our time up into four sections. Number one, what is a great high priest? For all you type A's that are taking notes, what is a high priest? Number two, what makes Jesus the great high priest? Number three, why we need a high priest? And number four, why Jesus changed everything? Why Jesus changed everything? So what is a high priest? If you guys remember, not that long ago, we were in the book of what? Oh, wow, okay, all right, cool, here we go. 
just a few months back before we went into the book of John, we were studying through the book of Exodus. For those of you that were new, that was a, that was a trick question. I apologize. That's not to out you or anything like that. But a few months back, we were, or gosh, about a year and a half ago, we started making our way through the book of Exodus. And in Exodus 28, 1, it says this, Then bring near to you Aaron, your brother, God speaking to Moses, and his sons with him from among the people of Israel to serve me as priests, Aaron and Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar. Now to fully understand how Jesus is a great high priest, we need to know what a high priest is. The job of the high priest was to be a mediator between God and Israel. If you remember our time in Exodus, we looked at this honorable title and why it was, an, why it was important for the people of Israel. The first high priest was the brother of Moses, Aaron. And Aaron comes, into, uh, Aaron comes onto the scene in a very interesting time in Moses' life. See, Moses has just gone to the burning bush and, and God is telling him, I'm sending you back so that you can free my people from Egypt. And Moses' main concern, do you guys remember what his main concern with himself was? He was not great at speaking. He was not great at speaking. And so God gave Aaron to Moses as a gift and a type of grace. Aaron stood in the gap and was a type of mediator to help communicate the words of God when Moses couldn't. One of the biggest responsibilities for a high priest was on a special day in Israel called the Day of Atonement. Everybody say Day of Atonement. If you remember, while the Israelites were, tra were traveling or when they were wandering through the desert, God had them build something called a tabernacle. And a tabernacle was essentially a mobile temple. And in that mobile temple was a special room called the Holy of Holies. And that, what made that, that room so special was that's where God's presence resided. That's where God's presence was, and nobody was allowed into that room or they would die. Except, what? Once a year, the high priest would go in on a special day called the Day of Atonement, and he would offer sacrifices for the sins of the people of Israel, including who? Themselves. Including themselves. The gravity of the situation and the weight of responsibility for the high priest is be, was beyond our frame of thinking of what pressure looked like. That was an incredibly uh, high pressure position. And so what makes Jesus a great high priest? Let's read our text. Hebrews 4.14 says, Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Three things are mentioned in our text this morning. Number one, no other high priest in the history of Israel, not even Aaron himself, was labeled great high priest. And in the Greek, this word great is megas, where we get our word mega. And so in some ways we can look at Jesus as the mega high priest. And this word, as you can imagine, in every sense is used to describe someone or something that has no comparison. He is the great, he is the mega high priest. And then we also see, secondly, that no other priest passed through the heavens, which we'll talk about in a second. And third, no other priest would dare accept the title, the second title that, that is given in Hebrews, that is the title of Son of God. 
which the author of Hebrews ascribes to Jesus explicitly and on repeat. There's a few other things that the author of Hebrews points out in his book, and that is that Jesus does not come from the lineage of Aaron. Now, God had set it up for all of Aaron's sons and all of Aaron's descendants to be the high priest for Israel. But Jesus did not come from the line or lineage of Aaron. Instead, in Hebrews chapter 5, we find out that Jesus came in what he calls the order of Melchizedek. Everybody say Melchizedek. I'm just doing that to keep you guys engaged. Melchizedek. We don't know a whole lot about Melchizedek. He shows up in the book of Genesis, just uh, in the time of Abraham. Um, and then he kind of falls off the map a little bit in the Bible. And then he kind of reappears back here when the author of Hebrews says that Jesus comes in the order of Melchizedek. And what he's essentially saying is that Jesus is, uh, uh, predates Aaron. And because he predates Aaron and was before Aaron, he is, I am, and therefore he is greater than Aaron. Fourthly, while only the high priest once a year was allowed into the Holy of Holies, Jesus ascended through the heavens to sit at the right hand of the Father. Psalm 110 verse 1 says this, The Lord says to my Lord, that's an odd statement, but it makes sense, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. No high priest, no regular high priest would dare sit in the presence of God or in the Holy of Holies. But Hebrews 10, 12 says this about Jesus, but when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he what? He sat down at the right hand of God, waiting for that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. Hebrews is, t is trying to tell us that Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, is the second member of the Trinity, the Son of God, and therefore equal with God, which is what makes Psalm 110 make sense. The Lord said to my Lord. And this makes him absolute, absolutely unequivocally better than any other high priest. Thirdly, and this is, this is crazy important, he does not offer an animal sacrifice to atone for the sins of humanity, but offers himself. This is what makes Jesus the great high priest. Lastly, his simultaneous deity and humanity makes him both great and soul suitable for the cross. And this points us to our, our next question, and that is, why do we need a great high priest? Why do we need a great high priest? Why isn't the other high priest good enough? Why do we need a great one? I believe the reason we are in so desperate need of a great high priest is because of the greatness of our sin. It's so easy for us to look at the people of Israel, of Israel and think they must have been crazy to be so full of doubt when they saw miracle after miracle after miracle. How could they be so faithless? How could they be so fickle? And I think if we do some pretty easy self-examination, we see we are not far. We see that we are not far from being so faithless and fickle. We ourselves are tempted to elevate our idols. Often our beliefs are so easily swayed by our culture. So let me ask this, what are the idols in our culture that pull us away from the good news of the gospel? Who are the people that we look to to fix the world that we live in when the only solution is who? It's Jesus. What or who are the things and people 
that we look to to save us or to be our Messiah. Paul Tripp says this, As much as we know that there is only one true God, we still hunt for God replacements. We all still tend to look horizontally for what we will ever find vertically. Second, our sinful nature separates us from God. Without atonement, because our God is so holy, because our God is so dedicated, because our God is so pure, the smallest sin within ourselves separates us from God. And so our natural inclination is to do what? Is to try to be better, right? We try by our own works, by our own efforts to make ourselves righteous, and yet the next day we wake up and we sin again. Yet the next day we wake up and we walk in the same pattern that we walked in. And even our own striving to be righteous ourselves gives us the credit that where, where the credit should only be given to who? Jesus. Jesus. That's an easy one, guys. The credit be only given to who? Jesus. There it is. That's my Calvary Costal Church. All right. But Jesus steps in as our great high priest and becomes our eternal great mediator. Because Jesus is better, we no longer go through the annual process of atonement. You guys see that? We no longer have to have Pastor John come up and offer a sacrifice of a lamb for your sins. Why? Because Jesus did it. Romans 6, 8 through 10 says, Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, uh, if you haven't read to the end of scripture, that happens. Spoiler alert. He raises, I know it's a spoiler alert for the book of John. That's coming. Raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. That last part is difficult for us to grasp, but we must. For those who are saved and in Christ, you are no longer a slave to sin. You no longer have to offer your, your hands to the shackles of sin anymore. We are not dead sacrifices, but we are living sacrifices. How is that possible? Because Jesus himself did not stay dead, but conquered sin and death. And so why do we choose to continue to live as a defeated people? Why do we continue to walk in, in a sin-victimized mentality when we have been made more than conquerors? When you have been given ambassador status, church, to walk into any room and know that you are a child of God? Why do we fear death? Why do we fear sin? So much so to offer ourselves back into the shackles of sin. You have been freed. You're, not a, you're no longer a slave to sin. This changes everything. This changes everything for you, church. This changes everything for me. It changes the way that we think of God. Because he came as a human and was susceptible to sin and tempted just like we are, but what? He was without sin. He did not sin. He went to the cross perfect and blameless. Hebrews 4.15 in our text, it says, For we do not have a high priest who is what? Unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Our text this morning says that he can sympathize with us in our weakness. David Guzik says this, Sometimes we think that because Jesus is God, he could never know temptation the way that we do. And in part, this is true. 
because Jesus faced temptation much more severely than we ever have or ever will. The sinless one knows temptation in ways that we do not because only the one who never gives in to temptation knows the full strength of temptation. Before you think that Jesus can't sympathize with us in our temptation to lust or our temptation to, 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 to put, place other things or other people as idols, understand that Jesus was tempted far more than we ever will be because we would sooner collapse than he would. As we saw last week, in the book of John, we saw that Jesus understands and feels grief when his friend Lazarus died. We see the shortest verse in all of scripture that says what? You guys can answer. Jesus wept. He wept. That's not a ghost. That's a human. A human weeps. And as the, he, as the author of Hebrews also said, he was also fully God. That's one of the core beliefs of Christianity, that Jesus came to this earth fully God and fully man. Again, this is why Jesus is better. He can sympathize with our temptation and our weakness, but without sin. Spurgeon says this to bring clarity to that idea. But listen to me. Do not imagine that if the Lord Jesus had sinned, he would have been more tender towards you. For sin is always of a hardening nature. If the Christ of God could have sinned, he would have lost the perfection of his sympathetic nature. Another way that it changes the way that we think of God is the way that we view his throne. Let's read our last verse, Hebrews 4, 16, that says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You see, the, Jew, the Jews viewed God's throne in two separate ways. They viewed it as a throne of judgment, and they also viewed it as a throne of mercy. But Jesus is better because he both fully fulfills, or perfectly, uh, sorry, he, he fulfills both perfectly and simultaneously. Jesus is better because he reveals God's grace to us. Remember that grace does not ignore God's justice. It operates in fulfillment of God's justice in the light of the cross. The other big thing that this changes in light of Jesus is how we respond to God today. This is how we have known that Jesus is better all the things that we've talked about helps us to know that Jesus is better, but then how do we show that Jesus is better? You guys know the difference between faith and belief. We all know that McDonald's is not good for you. And yet, how many of us went there this week? Oh, you guys are a lot healthier than I thought. <laughs> Dang, all right, good on you. Good job, you guys. We know that certain things are not good for us, and yet we often turn to them, right? We know that, that placing idols in, in, in our homes or, or in our minds is not good for us, and yet we're prone to it. How do we show that Jesus is better? Our text gives us two commands for us to apply to our lives today. The first is we are to hold fast to our confession and profession of faith, even in seasons of darkness and in doubt. Most of our doubts can be boiled down to us asking this question, is Jesus better? 
For some of you that may be where you're at today, is Jesus really better? And I remember one of my kids when they were struggling with this idea, yes, pastor's kids struggle with the idea of God, and that's okay. My wife and I welcome that. We know that doubt is not sin. But when one of our kids was struggling with this idea of doubt, what, what they were struggling with was, I, I'm just trying to figure out, is Jesus, is, is what Jesus has to offer better than evolution? Is what Jesus has to offer better than what my friends say? Is what Jesus has to offer truly better than everything else that I see in the world? And when we face compromising situations, are we all, are, are we all not wondering, is Jesus, Jesus' way better? If Jesus' way is truly better, like we say we believe, then we can hold fast to him. Remember at the very beginning when I, when I said that our, our, this deep longing that we're searching for is for some consistency, for hope, and for comfort. Jesus is better, and so we can hold fast to him for that comfort, consistency, and hope. Why? Because he's trustworthy. Regardless of, uh, of our current leaders, we know that we can look to him as our great and high priest, our mediator between us and God, regardless of what life throws our way. God is calling us today to trust in him. He is better than anything we can make up. He is a better Messiah than anything or anyone else we could possibly imagine. This will probably be the most political thing you ever hear me say, but we have a presidential uh, election coming up. And church, I just want to challenge us. Are we looking to these men and women as our savior? Do they have any hope of being our savior? Can we as a church commit Can we as a church commit to making Jesus our Savior? Can we as a church commit to go and to vote based off of our Christian values, our morals, but also recognizing that these men are going to fail us? These men and women in leadership are often going to fail. Sometimes they may make good choices. Sometimes they make bad choices. Can we recognize and remember that they're humans and not God humans, like our great high priest? This allows us to live in the freedom and the light of the gospel when we recognize who truly is our great high priest. In the light of who he is, we can, without hindrance, say that Jesus is truly what? Better. There you go. I've said it a thousand times already, guys. Come on. Come on. This is why I keep calling back. I want you guys to wake up. Jesus is truly what? Man, if you guys walk away not remembering a darn thing that I've said all for the last however long I've been talking, if you guys remember this one thing this week, that Jesus is better, your life will change. You will no longer watch the news and be afraid or be angry or be frustrated because you recognize that those people are humans. You recognize that our God is not. Our God is holy and perfect. Second, we can draw near to him. So we hold fast and then we draw near to him in confidence or boldness. 
You remember our time in Exodus and what we learned uh, this morning that only one person once a year, the high priest, was allowed to go into God's presence. Hebrews 4.16 in our text says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. Wait, am I missing something? In the book of Exodus it says that only one person once a year can come into God's presence. But wait a second, hold on, wait a minute. Am I reading that right? It says, let us. You guys catch that? Let us. Not let him at one point. He says, let us draw near to the throne of grace. Let us draw near. One of Satan's key strategies is to distract us from the access that we have to God's throne and to God's grace. He will say, yeah, you might have access, but you're going to have to do this and that first. Or he will lie and say that God is indifferent to your struggles and your pain because he's removed from your life. But God stepped into our humanity through his son, Jesus Christ, and experienced the same struggle and pain as we do, yet without sin. Satan will constantly point our attention and our allegiance to things and humans that we can see with our earthly eyes. He will constantly try to distract us, but we must hold fast to Christ. He will also say that the solution to the messed up world that we are living in is anyone or anything but God. But Jesus, church, is our great high priest. He's the one who went to the cross on the day of atonement. He is the high priest that went to the cross on the day of atonement. And when John the Baptist, after baptizing him, and he walked off, he said what? Behold, behold the Lamb of God, who what? You got it. Not covers, takes away. That was radical for the disciples to hear for the first time. They understood that. They understood that the lamb that was being sacrificed on the Day of Atonement only covered their sins, and they were longing for the Messiah that would come. So when John the Baptist and all of his crazy hair and locusts and honey-eating teeth was like, behold, that man is the Lamb of God. He doesn't cover, but he takes away the sins of the world. God himself is our mediator. Coming to him with boldness or confidence is not coming arrogantly. Remember, we have nothing to offer. We have nothing to offer. So we come to him in boldness like a child, like my kids come into my office. Most people come up and they knock and they say, are you free? My kids don't do that. They just come straight in because they know that they have access to me in a greater way. This word confidence in its original Greek language is parousia. Everybody say parousia. This word parousia is described in two different ways that I found absolutely fascinating. Follow with me. First, it gives the obvious definition of free and fearless confidence, cheerful and full of courage. Secondly, this word describes the freedom and undeservedness we are to have in our speech before God. Specifically, our speech before God. That we are to have confidence when we talk with God. So let me ask you, church, how do we regularly draw near to God with cheerful confidence in our worship? I'm getting there. You were right. That's the answer to my second question. Through our worship. And then secondly, how do we regularly draw near to God in our free and undeserved speech? Prayer. This is how we draw near. 
We draw near through our time of worship and we draw near through our time of prayer. This doesn't mean that we come before God in irreverence, but in boldness and humility to find what? Mercy. Grace and help in our time of need. Gosh, it's such an understatement to say this, but if there was ever a time for us as a church for us to be both on our knees and our feet in prayer and worship, it's now. Do you guys believe that? Gosh, is our world not falling apart? Is our world not striving and, and searching desperately in the dark for something to hold on to, for some semblance of, 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 of a foundation? You guys see it. I just want to draw your attention to something that, that is actually like, it's more than just a silver lining. I actually think it's like a, a beacon that we need to be looking at. And that is that our world is so topsy-turvy right now. Why? Because they're not looking for, or they haven't found yet, they're looking for a firm foundation for them to stand on. That's why what's okay today is not going to be okay next week. Certain things that you can say today are going to be politically incorrect next week or this and that. It's because we're longing for something. Our world is longing for something. Here's the thing. Everybody wants to write off Gen X, or uh, not Gen X, Gen X, you guys, Gen Xers, you guys are great. Uh, Gen Zs, millennials, Gen Zs, and Gen Alphas as there's no hope. I'm here to tell you guys right now, I could just rip this thing off. Gen Z and Gen Alpha are more primed for revival than we've seen since the Jesus movement. You know why? Because they're hungry. They're hungry, church. Gosh, they, they, they desperately need the love of Christ. And they want relationship with people. You know what social media has given our kids? A mile, a mile wide group of friends, but only an inch deep. The way that they view relationship is only an inch deep. It's not their fault. They're looking for something. They're looking for someone to love them. My gosh. What, what an opportunity. For those of you that think, oh, I'm too old to speak to Gen Alpha. I'm too old to speak to Gen Zers. Gosh, no, you are perfect. You are here for such a time as this to pour into our kids. If you don't think, if, if you think for one second that children's ministry is not real ministry, repent. i would just be totally honest. Repent. Repent. Those are my kids. Those are your kids that need the love of Christ. My gosh. What an opportunity to serve and love and to draw near. Suffer the little ones to me. Man, those kids will rock your world. If you feel like you don't, you're, you're not equipped or you don't know, that neither were any of the disciples that changed the world fully unequipped. I'm going on a rant. I know it. I feel it. I'm looking at the clock. I want to be aware of your time, but you guys, I, I, I desperately want you guys to know we, we are not hopeless. My gosh, we are not hopeless. Our world is so ready for the love of Christ. Our world is so ready for the gospel. You know how we show it? Last thing. You know how we show it? By loving one another. John 13, 35 says, By this they will know that you are my disciples. By what? How you love one another. This is not a time for us as a church to be divided. You know what I love about worship? What I love about worship is that we 
can be one body singing with one voice, one song to one God. So what makes something better as we close? It works better, right? If we're gonna call something better, it has to work better. Aaron and his sons, though they were the high priests who offered up sacrifices for the people of Israel, they had sins too. And, they sacrifi- and, their, and the sacrifices that they made was for themselves as well. The sacrifice of animals only went so far to cover the sins of man, but Jesus' sacrifice was wholly greater than theirs because he gave himself. Because he was God, he was perfect, and he didn't have to atone for his own sins, but solely for ours. Because he was also holy man, his sacrifice was one and done to atone for the sins of men eternally. Our good works, apart from his justification, his making us right, don't get us far. Versus, uh, versus his righteousness that is imputed to us brings us back into right relationship with God the Father. Second way that, some, that uh, something makes something better than others is uh, it produces better results. As we mentioned, the Day of Atonement was simply a picture of God's great sacrifice on the cross. It was just a picture of it, a foreshadow. And lastly, what makes something better is it lasts or stands the test of time. Jesus, 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 Jesus showed us through his resurrection that he is eternal and eternally great. If the fear of death can't trap us, church, what or who do we have to fear? As a final word, as the worship team comes up, I would like to submit that our growth in the Christian life stems from and is hinged upon us realizing that Jesus is better. When we are faced with temptation, when we are being sanctified, when we find ourselves in times of need and we ask ourselves, is Jesus better? May we come back to this text in Hebrews. Ooh.